John, I must say, that Hall of Fame blazer looks great on you. You waited a good while to get it. Uh, let's start at the end before we begin at the beginning. Uh, what does that mean to you to be able to put that jacket on and be a member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame? Well, it, Stan, it's great to be have that recognition. You know, I, I've spoken over the past, I don't know how many years since I got in the jacket, about what it took, what, what I was thinking about during my career. It wasn't about a Hall of Fame jacket. It was about <clears throat> getting out and working as hard as I could, uh, and, you know, perfecting my craft. It was about helping our team win games and, and win Super Bowls. It, would about, it was about supporting my teammates and having them respect me for the job that I was doing. And, and that, I think, was worthwhile, and I could have lived with that. But to know that uh, a group of select folks who vote on these things, uh, Hall of Fame things, and that they said that I was worthy enough to, and my career was, was uh, worthy enough to be selected to be a part of a very select group, that uh, uh, it, it, is, it is great to be a part of that, that grouping. Would you have felt that your career was partially unfulfilled had you not gotten into Canton, or with what you just described, would that have been enough? You know, there's a part of me that's, that wants to say that it would have been enough, but there's a part of me that's screaming, no, it wouldn't <laughs> have been enough. <laughs> uh, but, you know, when I saw, when it, you know, certainly we saw Joe go in, and we saw Lambert go in, and Webster and Ham, and, and Mel, and, 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 and Terry, certainly I wanted to be a part of that, and, um, and uh, to be recognized as being a part of that, and, and I got the opportunity to do that, and after several years of voting, I got a, I got a chance to go in, so, um, nah, I, I, I guess ultimately I had to say it wouldn't have been enough. Now you're human, you're allowed to, to feel that way. I think, I think uh, most people would feel that way. So many people were thrilled, including myself, that, that you got in. It was, it was certainly well deserved. Uh, let's go back to the beginning. Uh, in this day and age, John, kids come out of high school and they're already thinking about, can I play in the NFL? I want to play in the NBA. I want to be a Major League Baseball player. I mean, they're, they're brought up that way, maybe when they're in junior high school. Uh, I'm wondering, when you got ready to go to college, getting out of high school, did you think about the NFL, or was that such a distant visage that it really didn't even cross your mind? See, yeah, you know, I've watched football, you know, ever since I was a little kid, watched professional football. And I think every kid, at least once in his life, dreams of being out on the field and playing and being a part of that. But it was a fanciful thing, you know, nothing that, that I thought would be real. Uh, my dream was to go to college. My dream was to have an opportunity after high school to get an education, to, to better myself, to be uh, a good father to, uh, to my kids, uh, to be a good husband, to be a valuable part of our community. And I thought having a college education could do that. And so the, the fact that I got a, a scholarship to go to, play, to, to school helped because I knew my, my family could not afford to do that. And so uh, playing football was a means to the end. The end was to get a college education. By going to a smaller school like Alabama uh, AM and n did that pretty much preclude your thought about becoming a pro? Oh, they'll never find me here at a small school? You, you know, it never entered my mind in my first two years at A&M. Uh, it was that I now I got an opportunity to, to realize, as I said earlier, my dream of going to college and, and to get a college education. So it wasn't until my junior year when I started to get visits from scouts in the NFL and different teams and, and folks like Bill Nunn coming by and, and speaking uh, with me about the potential of going to the next level that I started to think about it. Um, and as time goes on and more of those visits happen, I'm thinking a little bit more about it. And, and then to the point where maybe my latter part of my junior year, I'm thinking maybe this may be a reality. I'll get a shot to do that. And now I need to think about how, how I'll handle that. What would be my approach in a professional football camp? I don't know anything about what goes on in camp. I don't, know, I don't know another professional football player to sit down and talk to about what to expect in training camp, what kind of athletes are, you gonna, uh, are gonna be there. So I'm on my own trying to figure out what my approach would be. Mentally, how am I gonna handle this? Physically, how am I gonna handle this? And, and, and so there it was and, and, and trying to figure it out. Let me digress just a moment because you brought up Bill Nunn's name. You're one of the poster guys for what Bill Nunn 
did, not only for the Steelers, but the entire NFL and for society. I mean, he found Elsie Greenwood at a very small school. Uh, Donnie Shell from your class, and, and you, uh, you said you began to get visits, but Bill Nunn, was he the forerunner? I mean, did, did people know that Bill Nunn was scouring the countryside for great football players? I don't know that, that the world knew. I, I, I certainly, I think that the, 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 the Rooney and Dan in particular, Dan Rooney in particular, knew of the potential of having um, a Bill Nunn as part of his scouting staff and, and the door that that would open and, and to, the, to the vast amount of talent that was in uh, Black House football. I think they knew, but you know, I don't think the world knew. You know, there were of the scouts that came to Alabama A&M. Uh, Bill was the only one I knew by name. The uh, the other guys, I kind of felt stopped because, well, it's a place to stop. You know, uh, maybe uh, Bill came with a seriousness about him uh, that there's 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 a talent here. There are talents here, not only at Alabama A&M, but the other black institutions across the South. That, uh, that could be helpful to our football team, uh, certainly open a door to a lot of uh, young, fo young guys who had, to, had the potential to play and to, do, to excel in the NFL. And that's what Bill's visit meant. Uh, if you had a Bill Nunn talking about you at, at a black college, or Bill Nunn who as, as uh, the sports editor for the Pittsburgh Courier uh, naming you a part of his All-American team, and then, you know, that, that validates you. Uh, that, that lifted you to a higher level and exposed you to the opportunity that was the National Football League. Based on the fact that Bill and other teams came by to visit, uh, draft day 1974, I'm gathering that being drafted was not a surprise for you. Uh, I expected to get drafted. And, and, and uh, you know, my ego, my ego being what it was, I expected to get drafted higher than I did. Um, I didn't, had no idea, even none, the none was there, I had no idea that it was going to be the Pittsburgh Seals. Um, I had, um, I'm, I'm thinking of teams that threw the football, and there weren't a whole lot of them then, but teams that threw the football, and that might be a receiver, that those were the teams that I kind of gravitated toward. Uh, and then being drafted by the Steelers and, and knew nothing of the Steelers. Um, uh, certainly, when well, I say nothing, I knew that they had a great defensive line, a great, a big, burly guy that played defensive tackle. My <laughs> name was Green, and and uh, but that's about all all I knew about them. And you know, and and they ran the football, and so you know they don't need me. They gonna run the football, and so I I didn't think I was going to come to the Steelers, but uh, I did. And uh, but I expected to be drafted maybe a little bit higher. Uh, the big. I guess if there was a downer in that, is that we took a receiver before we took me. And I'm thinking, well, they think more of somebody else than they think of me. And, and then in my mind, if you were a first round draft choice, you were what the team wanted, what they, and you, you were expected to be excellent and you, you were gonna make the team. Uh, second round draft choice was, was bordered on that. Third round draft choice, but a fourth round draft choice, you know, you were subject to be cut just like anybody else. And so I, 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 didn't, I didn't think my making the team was a given. Uh, I, th I thought, and I talked about earlier, my approach to, to, uh, uh, to coming to the NFL because I didn't know anything about the NFL was my approach was that I was going to not make any friends, uh, that I was going to be totally centered on making the football team, that I was going to be physically prepared you know, in shape and, and ready to run as much as anybody's going to run, uh, that mentally I was going to do the things that it took to, to know the playbook so that I was gonna, not going to make any mental mistakes. And, and that if I was going to be cut, you know, they want to cut me because I didn't have the talent to play in the league. And that was the only reason they're going to cut me. They're gonna, not going to cut me because I wasn't in shape, and they're not going to cut me because I don't know my material. They're going to cut me because I'm not, just not capable of playing in this league. Franco tells the story when he got drafted by the Steelers. Oh, no, I, I don't want – and even Joe Green said, Pittsburgh, oh, you're a kid from Alabama. And I wondered if there was any uh, – I don't know if you'd ever been up north, if you'd ever been to Pittsburgh. Did the thought of playing in the snow and the cold, did that come into your mind? It was like going to another universe. No, uh, you know, the, the environment uh, didn't come into mind at all. Um, what I thought about was uh, 
what the team philosophy was as far as throwing the football. You know, my, my thought was that you go into Pittsburgh and they, they don't throw the football and that's the kiss of death. You know, you, you know, at the time I came to the league, there wasn't any, not a whole lot, were any, hardly any guys that were catching 100 passes a year or more. You know, that's kind of commonplace in today's game. But the, the benchmark was catching 40 passes a year. And the leading receivers for Pittsburgh was catching like 30. So we not, they're not even, uh, at that time, they're not even up to the league, at, you know, what the league considers to be elite. And uh, so I'm thinking catching 8, 9, 10, 12 passes a year ain't a whole lot of fun for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> that wants to be a factor. And you had the block, too. Yeah, oh, yeah. You had, had, yeah. had the block. You mentioned you didn't know anything about NFL training camp. And I'm wondering when you got to Latrobe and you got to St. Vincent, uh, how long did it take you to realize that I belong here, I can play here, I can do this? Well, Sam, let me take you back to 1974, and, and that was a year that a lot of veteran players decided that uh, the collective bargaining agreement wasn't fair. So a lot of those guys didn't come to training camp. That was a strike year. So we, are, we the, the rookies, are in, in camp, a very few veterans are, are in there with us. And the league is saying, the ownership and, and the coaches are saying, you know, we're preparing to play the season without the veterans. So you know, Green's not there, Blunt's not there, um, and uh, none of the veterans. Bradshaw's not there, Joe Gillum's in camp, Bradshaw's not there. So I could look at the other, other rookies and say, yeah, you know, I, I, I can be here. Um, and uh, and any time I felt a little bit too sure of myself, Lionel Taylor, our receiver coach, would come to me and he said, "Well, you're doing great against these rookies, but when Mel gets here, you're not going to be able to do that." And I told myself that, um, uh, well, you know, I'm going to forget about that because I don't care who's here, I'm going to be able to do what I'm doing. We our one of our first preseason games was against New Orleans, and so Mel lives in New Orleans, so Mel came to the game and he's standing on the sideline. And, and, and um, uh, so guys are saying, and, and that's Mel Blunt over there. So for some reason, somehow, I ended up standing next to Mel uh, at one point during the course of the game. And I'm looking up, and I'm saying, this is a defensive back. <laughs> and in my mind, in the back of my mind, I'm saying, well, maybe I won't be able to do that. <laughs> that's when Mel gets here. But, um, uh, we had a we had a long training camp to answer your, a long answer to your question. It took getting those veteran guys into training camp, me seeing the caliber of players that they were, me seeing the Ron, our starting receivers at that time, Ron Shanklin and Frank Lewis, run their routes, uh, run their you know their patterns, see them that they weren't catching every ball that's thrown to them, to know that you don't you don't have to be perfect in this league. You had to be close to it, but perfection in my mind as far as me catching every pass and not making a, a mental mistake, I, I knew I couldn't do that. That's not humanly possible in the course of time, but I didn't know whether other folks could. And, and seeing them and, and whatever imperfections they had uh, convinced me that I could play in the league. You mentioned uh, another wide receiver who was uh, drafted ahead of you in 1974. Uh, you mentioned you're measuring yourself up and watching the veterans' performance, but out of the corner of your eye, were you measuring yourself against your Hall of Fame mate, Lynn Swan? I, I, I and from day one, uh, that was it. You know, that that was the challenge that I knew. Uh, that was a challenge from day one that I could see, and I could measure myself. I couldn't measure myself against how I ran against Mel Blunt or what, how I looked against compared to. Ron Shanklin or, or Frank Lewis, but I couldn't measure myself there. Uh, and I knew that by virtue of him being a number one draft choice, that, that some parts of the organization felt that he was better uh, than I was. So that, that to me was the immediate challenge, and, and that was what I looked at and, and, and measured myself. And, and you know, after a few days, I thought I could. I thought that uh, I was as, as, as good um, and at some points, maybe even better than, than our number one draft choice. Now, that wasn't something I stood up on a high mountain and said to anybody, and, and that's not my nature to do that. But certainly, um, my own uh, confidence in myself and my abilities 
uh, wouldn't let myself believe anything less than that. Six preseason games back in those days. And I wonder, was there a point when Lionel came to you or Chuck came to you um, and pretty much assured you, hey, we, we love what you're doing. You're going to be a part of this group. Uh, about four days into training camp, and I mentioned my philosophy was um, being in shape and, and, and coming into a training camp was I going to be in shape, mentally prepared. And, and I felt that that I needed to, if we're on the field, I need to be running whatever, whatever we were doing. If we were going from, from uh, position A to position B to do another drill, I needed to run there. I needed to be first there. Um, and, and put a lot of stress on myself because of that. But after about five days of training camp, you know, I'm not drinking a whole lot of fluids, so I, I ended up with a severe case of cramps. And so I'm sent to the, um, um, I'm sent to the hospital with cramps. And they, and it's after the first practice that day, and so I'm, I, I get fluids intravenously, and, and uh, they finally release me. But by the time I was released, I got back to, to training camp, and they were in the second practice. And I just knew I'm cut. I just, you know, I, in my mind, I'm, I'm not here anymore. I'm, I'm, in my mind, I'm saying, look around, take it in, because when your friends ask questions when you get back home, you want to have some answers for them, right? <laughs> and so, uh, and then I, I'm on the field, and uh, I, I go down the field uh, after coming from the hospital, and I'm standing, and Lionel Taylor comes over to me, and you, you certainly remember Lionel and how colorful he was, uh, not only in his, his persona, but his way of speaking, and, and speaking to players. And, and he came over and, and, and told me to get the, off his field. And I'm thinking, well, that confirms it. I'm cut. And so I walk maybe 25 yards away from him, and I stop and stand to take in a little bit more. And then he, he comes over to me again in and, and a much more colorful language. And I'm not used to being coaches talking to me that way. And, and um, he tells me even more so to get off, the, and that's it. And so I go back up, and I'm in the locker room. The team comes up after practice, and no one says anything to me. So I go to dinner, and, and I get back, and and uh, and then someone comes over and tells me that Chuck wants to see me. He wants to talk to me. Uh oh, it's, it's over. You know, this is my last <laughs> night. <laughs> my, my thoughts were whether they're going to let me sleep tonight and go 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 home, or whether they're going to send me home right away. Well, they let you have the last <laughs> supper, right? So you, that was it, the last supper. So uh, Chuck comes to me, and Chuck, uh, well, I go to Chuck, and, and, and I look at him, and he says, John, you got cramps. You know, you're not taking enough fluids in. You need to take more fluids in. So, you know, maybe you want to go down to the local watering hole and have a couple of beers. And I'm thinking, well, wow, it, this head coach in the National Football League is telling me to deviate from my training and have and drink a couple of beers. And, and I'm thinking, wow, this is the NFL, right? And so uh, I make it through that. And, and so there was, there was a doubt in my mind that um, uh, whether I was going to make it or not uh, and whether they wanted me or not. But I, I came away from that. And, and, and a few days later, Lionel Taylor comes to answer your question. Lionel Taylor comes to me and he says, Slow down, relax. You're gonna make the team, and that um, we believe that we, in in this year's draft that we got three number one draft choices, and uh, and and you're being one of them. Just slow down, relax, uh, and and do what you know to do, and 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 get better and, and do what you and and so that was a confirmation, and I think. That was probably three games into the preseason, and uh, and so I, I called home all excited, and, and I told my wife that what Lionel had said, and she said, "Well, what is he the head coach?" And I said, "No." He said, "Well, you know, you <laughs> <laughs> it's not the head coach. You don't believe him, you know." So it's and so anyway, that that's uh, Lionel did come to me, and he tried to to. Uh, uh, and I guess I looked a little bit nervous, Stan. I think I was probably a little bit jittery, um, antsy about everything, um, maybe in some ways defensive. Um, you know, I'm a fourth-round draft choice, and, and uh, I don't know what's going to happen. 
Um, and after he told me that, I relaxed. I, I, I had a good preseason. I think I probably, albeit that we, it was a strike year, um, I probably led the league in receptions and yards per catch. Uh, so you know, I felt pretty good about myself going into the season. Well, they talk about receivers hearing footsteps. In your case, it was the Turk patting the halls, oh, yeah. waiting to knock at the, uh, knock at the door. You fast forward, John, and your rookie season and your sophomore season, if you will, you're Super Bowl champions. Um, my first question would be, did you think, oh, well, this is easy. This is, you know, this is going to happen all the time when you win two Super Bowls in your first two years. Well, I kind of felt that the you know, Super Bowl was part you know, I came in that way and that it was going to be a, a part of our team and something we would do every, every year. Um, that was, you know, I guess in my mind, not as challenging to do as it was to be better and a bigger part of our team. You know, you know we were throwing the ball sparingly. Uh, my second year, uh, Lynn comes into his own, and rightfully so. Brasha, he and Brashaw form a connection, and, and he's, he, he's catching a lot of passes, doing some great things for our football team and getting the recognition for doing that. Um, I'm, we traded Ron Shanklin, so Lynn's on, on the right side by himself, so he, he's a full-time starter. I'm, I'm on the left side, and, and, and I think somewhere listed as a starter, but I'm sharing time with Frank Lewis, who's the you know, number one draft choice from a few years before us. So I still, in my mind, I still haven't got there. I, I, in my mind, personally, there's still a challenge to be better, uh, to achieve the st to the point where I'm, I am the starter and, and, and not, being, not being challenged by that, not that I was going to step back away from, from trying to be the best each and every day, but, but not challenged by that, um, that I'm, I brush out equally is when he drops back and he's looking for a receiver that he has confidence in and he's going to maybe trust that I'm, I'm that guy or at least one of those guys, uh, that still hadn't happened. And so I'm, I'm still challenged by that, and I'm still working toward that. And, and that, greater than repeating as a Super Bowl champ, uh, is the thing that's driving me, uh, to, to personally reach the, the point where I feel like that I'm being recognized for the talents that I have and, and my ability to do some things. It's interesting you mention that, because I wanted to ask you about uh, any wide receiver. It was great running game and unbelievable defense back in those years. And I wonder, then a couple of years of a drought, I shouldn't say drought, winning football, but not in the Super Bowl. And then they changed the rules. Um, Mel Blunt, a primary reason for that. Mm -hmm. And I've always felt that one of the great things about Chuck is that he recognized that he had great offensive weapons, and when the reins were loosened, he was going to take full advantage of that. And I wondered if you sensed that when those rules changed in 77, that now the Steelers were going to use all their weapons, including Jim Smith, you, and Lynn Swan, and let Bradshaw go to town. And I wonder if you sensed that this is my opportunity to contribute more than I have in the past. Certainly, I, I, certainly, I knew the rules had been changed, um, but I, di I didn't sense that that was going to make things easier for me. Um, you know, I grew up as a National Football Player, uh, uh, playing the left side for the Pittsburgh Steelers, and and playing playing the the opposite corner for me in practice every day was Mel Blunt. So I, I grew up with Mel's physical style of play. I became accustomed to Mel's physical side of play. I, I, I felt like that I could, I, whoever we were playing, uh, because I was going against one of the best in the league, if not the best in the league, every day in that, in that style of play, that I, was, that I was going to be okay whether they changed the rule or not. So I didn't look at, and, and certainly that's not to reflect on what Chuck thought or what Dan thought or what any of the offensive people thought or, or that it was going to, now we got a heyday and we got a chance to, to excel. I felt that I was going to do well in, in, in the old system. All I needed was a quarterback that looked my way and gave me the opportunity to do that. Um, as it turned out, yes, sir, history certainly reflects that the rule change and Bradshaw's development and Swan and I being 
a part of the team that, that we started to excel in doing that. And in and, and hindsight, yeah, it was easier. Um, and, but I didn't see it as uh, the coming of the dawn of the, the great deep threats of the Pittsburgh Steelers because of rule change. Was there a particular point, John, where you felt that you earned Bradshaw's trust? We hear about quarterbacks and receivers having to trust one another. Was there a point at which you thought you developed a rapport that at least he would look your way at least as often as he looked Lynn Swan's way? Yeah, my, my first, second, and third year, I got some injury things going on, different things. And uh, so it curtailed my, my, my playing time um, during the course of that year. And in my fourth year, um, I played an injury-free uh, season. And I think that was the year uh, that, um, that, that sort of happened. I got Brash out of attention. He's going to throw me the football. Um, Lynn's, Lynn's going through in our fourth year what I went through in my second and third year. he got some nagging things going on. He has a turf toe. And so, you know, I, I'm there and uh, Brash out throwing me the football. And I think in my fourth year it started, it started to happen. And I, I think we were able to gain that. And so now with his confidence in Bradshaw, on, I mean in Swan on the right and me on the left, that, uh, that we started to, to excel. Uh, but I think for me it was my, my fourth year in the league. There's a cliche, but it's not a cliche because it's true that great players make great plays in the biggest games. <clears throat> and I think back to Super Bowl thirteen. Steelers got off to a bad start. Hollywood Henderson, they steal the ball and rip it out of Bradshaw's arms and you're down. Do you feel like that touchdown pass and the long run, subsequent long run, changed that game, changed the dynamic of that game? You know, I, I think, I don't know whether it changed the game, um, but it, it certainly put us back in a, in a, in a positive mode after a, a, a negative had happened. A negative that could, with some teams, put us in the tank uh, to the extent that, you know, it's, it's going to be hard to get back from that. Uh, if you look at the opposite sidelines and they're happy and they're excited about what they just did. And so we needed something to, to at least equalize things a little bit. And I think that long run was, a, was an opportunity to do that. And, and maybe go up a little bit, you know, maybe in, in their minds is, you know, what do we have to do now? Um, and so uh, that long run gave us an opportunity to get back into it. Uh, they thought Bradshaw was hurt. He's not hurt. Uh, we score fairly easily. I mean, that's, we, uh, it was a third down pass and we were, what, 75 yards away from, 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 from scoring and we score fairly easily. Uh, so. Uh, but the whole game, I think, against them and, and, and their quarterback, Roger Staubach, and his ability to come back in, 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 in difficult times. And he, if you go a little bit fur further down into the game in the second half, you know, Roger's mounting a comeback. And so uh, I think it kept in our minds uh, the fact that, uh, that we can, we're going to win this football game that we're in contention is, and it kept them in doubt. Uh, so in, th in that sense, I think it did. I don't know, I don't know whether it's a game changer, but I think it's, a, it, certainly, uh, it, it certainly maybe made things a little bit equal for, for both sides. And a big thank you to Jackie Smith while we're at it. Let, let, let oh, that yeah. You oh, need, yeah. You need I, a break. I, can ima I cannot imagine living the rest of my life with that. <laughs> with that. <laughs> I think that might have been his, his own, only Super Bowl, you know, and he, and, and he missed that. I'm, I'm not sure that was his only one, but certainly to, to, to see the highlights of himself and the ball bouncing off his chest, I mean, wow. You know, it's, it's almost Bill Buckner-like. Bill Buckner was a terrific ball player. I mean, he made the one error, and everybody knew him for that. Jackie Smith was a fantastic tight end in the NFL for years, finishing up his career. And unfortunately, I'm sure in Dallas, they, they remember him for that. Um, moving on to Super Bowl fourteen against the Rams, this was uh, really the, the John Stallwer show. Um, Terry always recites the play, and it was so long, I can never, 60 slot hook and go, whatever 60 prevent slot hook and go. 
What was your what was your responsibility on that play, and why did it work? And you know, you mentioned Terry reciting the play. Terry, it was 60 prevent slot hook and go. And Terry, in recent interviews, is calling it 70 prevent <laughs> slot hook and go. So I, I need to correct that him on that when I see him. Uh, my assignment. Uh, let me give you a little bit more history about why we put the play in. The play was put in because we felt that we were going to be, as receivers, Swan and I felt that we were going to be double covered. Um, and the style of double coverage that they, they had for us was what we call in and out. There was going to be a guy on my inside preventing me from coming to the inside to run our medium routes on the inside. There was going to be a guy on my outside about at the same level who's going to stop me from going outside and running those routes. Um, and the, the only thing that was available given that coverage was deep. And so we put the play in and going into the week, um, 60 prevent slot, and I'm in the slot, hook, fake a hook, and go. Um, and so we put it in, it never worked in practice, <laughs> never worked in practice. The, the, the inside guy or nor the outside guy would ever bite on the hook because they knew the go was coming. Okay, so we, we, we didn't run it early in the game. And as it turned out, all of our medium routes were, were covered. We, um, we were not very good passing the football, and they were, they were shutting us down, I think, running the football to some degree. Um, and so second half, we decided to chuck the sides to put the play in. He realized that we're not going to beat them playing conservative, uh, medium route kind of football. So Chuck puts it in. Uh, my, my route as a slot receiver was to go down, fake the hook. Hopefully someone would bite on that and to go deep. And uh, mostly that's going to be the inside guy that's going to do that. Um, so I ran the route, we call it. I'm not thinking this is, this is going to save the day when we started. It never worked in practice. You know, and I'm, I'm thinking, I'm going to run it and we're going to see what happens. But you know, it's not my, I'm not thinking, oh, glory, we finally got to it. No, and so I, I run it, and, when, and, and in running it, I never fake the hook. You know, I, I, I read the guy on the inside of me, and, and, and um, he's still, he's a little bit behind me. So if I fake the hook, he's going to catch up with me. So I just, you know, maybe I think I nodded my head to the inside, and maybe and I just kept running. And so Bradshaw throws the football, and my instinct when I saw the ball and saw the trajectory of the ball was, oh, crap, Bradshaw, you've overthrown me. <laughs> and, um, and so I kept running. I turned, turned away from the ball, actually ran, you know, ran a few steps and looked back. And when I looked back, my, the ball was, you'd like for, if you're running a, a pattern like, a path like this and it's a deep ball, you'd like for that ball to be here. And so when I look back, and the ball is actually here on, over, over my, my uh, right shoulder instead of my left shoulder. So I have to look back here to catch the football. Um, and so the defensive back that's on me, I think had I been, had Bradshaw thrown the ball where I thought it was going to be or where likely it should be, I think that guy probably knocks the ball away. Uh, but that is thrown here. And I see that, and he doesn't, so he jumps here. The ball's here, I catch it, and we go in for the touchdown. Just like that? Yeah, it never worked in practice. <laughs> <laughs> no reason to practice yeah. that. Uh, that game, John, you were down at halftime, and I wonder if there was not grave concern, but serious concern about being down at half. I think we were concerned, you know, we were concerned that um, Nothing that we were doing was, you know, we, we, it was hard for us to get any consistency, you know. Uh, you know other than the initial drive of Franco scores, it was hard for us to get any consistency. We missed field goals. Um, and so uh, we needed to get some consistency with what we were doing and it just seemed like that. So that was a concern. I think in the back of, at least my mind, I don't know how about anything about the other, what the other guys were thinking, but in the back of my mind I'm thinking, and we've been here three times, and we've won three times. You know, where, where there's a, the law of averages sort of catch up with it, you know, that, you know, three out of four ain't bad, you know, kind of thing. And so you, you kind of in the back of your mind, you're thinking that. Um, 
But I, I, you know, I look back on our history and at that time and the things that we have done as a group, and uh, that I think we had the ability to overcome uh, different situations, and we had the personnel to do that. Um, and uh, so there was there was a strong possibility that that, that wasn't going to happen. But you at least it at least crosses your mind that it may. Um, but we had, you know, we came in into the half. And it's a new half, and it's a new day. And um, um, even though we were behind, you know, you, I look at—I don't know what's, what was in Chuck mind. I don't remember anything that he said during, during the halftime. Uh, but there's a little clip on the highlight reel for that game, and it shows him playfully toying with a with a cameraman, running uh, off the field, running off the field. And so you know, maybe he has something in his mind that he just hadn't revealed to us yet. So he had a big smile on his face. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, John, if before the game, if it occurred to you that this is our fourth trip here in six years, and you went on to play a significant number of seasons after that, but a lot of the guys, you know, they played a couple more years and that was it. Did the thought cross your mind that maybe this will be it? I mean, we've been together a long time, and subsequently, after the game, did you think, we won four for four, but given the fact that most of us are now have been around for a while, that this might be it, as it turned out to be. You know, Sam, I, I, I did not. Um, certainly, I knew that that um, that some of my guys were getting older. Um, you know, uh, uh, Joe, I think, was probably in his tenth or eleventh year, or something like that, and LC and. Bradshaw's only a year behind that, and so I'm, a, I'm and male also. So folks are getting older, but we we we'd had so much success drafting people and bringing people in that I, I at that point I'm thinking, well, you know Joe retires and we get a, we got a number one draft choice. We'll draft another Joe Green, and Bradshaw's going to retire, but we'll draft another Terry Bradshaw or Blunt. And, and I'm very naive in that. And I realized maybe after that game, not right after, maybe a couple of years after that game, that you don't just happen to draft a Joe Green or a Terry Bradshaw or a Mel Blunt. Uh, you know, those, those players come along, you know, once in a lifetime for a team. Uh, and, and, and maybe you'll get a guy 20 years from now who will be as good as Green, but maybe talented physically, but maybe not have the leadership abilities of Joe Green. So it's difficult to get those guys. So to answer your question, I, no, I, I, I wasn't thinking that this is the end of an era. Um, I, I thought maybe this is the end of the Joe Green part of the success of the team, but we'd, we'd have a Gabe Rivera who'd come along and he'd take Joe's place. And we'd have uh, the next guy to be the male blunt, or the next guy to be Terry Bradshaw, and that we were drafting, we, we, we were that astute at drafting great players that it, we were just going to get another one. Uh, and it wasn't until those guys were gone, and you know, a few years down the road, and, and we weren't replacing them. You know, I, you know look around, and, and Lambert's not there, and you know, look around, and, and Hammer's not there. Mel's gone, and Joe's gone, and LC's gone, and, and uh, Swan's gone, and Bradshaw's gone. So we, I'm dealing with a whole, whole new set of folks. And, 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 and in my mind thinking, you know, heck, this, is ain't, this ain't as easy as we, we, I thought it was going to be. And, and I realized also how fortunate we were, how blessed we were, um, and, and the contributions are going back to a Bill Nunn who was, who was uh, who was researching and 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 in in the area where there were very other people, very few other folks researching and trying to and bringing talent in? Uh, I realized that you know that just doesn't happen. You know how special that time was in the history of of, uh, of the Pittsburgh Steelers, and certainly a time that I think uh, sort of put the team on a on a different path than it was the 40 years before that. That uh, you know now we have a winning tradition. We have something that we a standard has been set, and um, it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna we gotta maintain that. Uh, but it's there, 
you know, we know we can win, we know we can win in a small market, and we know we can bring the players to bear to do that. And so it's different than it was those, those last 40 years. You outlasted a lot of the players that you came in with, and you had some moderate success, uh, you know, playoffs in the strike year, AFC Championship game against Miami in 1984. But I'm wondering, given all you had experienced, if it was as enjoyable. You were still playing the game, but you know Bradshaw's gone, so it's David Woodley and it's Mark Malone. Um, and not just about the quarterbacks, but was it as enjoyable for you with really Super Bowls probably not on the horizon? Short answer to that is, is, is no, it wasn't. And, and, it's, and I, I'll, I'll use the, my 500th reception and maybe to, 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 to tell that story. Um, 500 reception at the time was a, a landmark kind of number, certainly in the history of the, of the Pittsburgh Steelers, but in the history of the league, you know, guys were not, you know, there was, I think there were some guys that had caught 800 passes or something like that, but they were very rare. So, you know, a, a 500 catch was significant. So we're playing and uh, I caught the, my 500 catch and I'm, uh, excited! I knew what the potential was going to happen in that game, so you know it does happen. And and then I, I look around and the guys that I'm celebrating with are not the guys that saw the other 499. <laughs> you know, um, Lynn wasn't there, and 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 so you know the, the experiences that we had as a tandem wasn't there. And the guy that threw me most of those passes wasn't there, as you mentioned, and you know. The, uh, you know, the guys on defense and the guy that kind of molded me as a receiver and Mel Blunt wasn't there. And it, I think it was less special. You know, it was significant, yes, uh, in my career, in the history of the Steelers, in the history of the league, but it wasn't the same. Who did throw the 500th catch? You, you would ask that. You know, I don't even remember who You don't, that. I don't either. I thought it, you it, would. It was, it was the quarterback we had doing that that was a strike year and it was the quarterback that we had doing that strike year and in fact it Steve Bono it might have been Bono and 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 um not all the guys who were you know we were playing with replacement players or something like that at the time so you know I mean that even just sort of made it even less significant yeah. you went on to have a remarkable successful business career, uh, forming an aeronautical industry company uh, in Huntsville, correct? Mm -hmm. um, multi, multi-million dollar business, and anyone who knows you was not surprised at that. But I'm just wondering, John, I've had so many former players tell me that, um, and believe me, even media guys were intimidated by Chuck Knoll. Uh, whenever I was about to interview him, I would just say to myself, please don't say anything too stupid uh, because, you know, you get that stare. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm wondering, I've had so many former players tell me that things they learned from Chuck about life resonated with them in their life after football when they got on with their life's work. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering if you found that to be the case. I, I, I did, and and I still do. You know, um, in things that I do, I, th I still think about the conversations that Chuck and I had, and and not to go away from your question, the individuals you named, but also conversations that Dan and I had. You know, the the uh, the organization and its approach to its players, its concern in my mind for its players above their ability to, to run and catch a football or throw a football or block or tackle um, uh, was, was significant to me. It was a comfort to me. I felt good in the environment because I thought I was valued for more than just what I did on the football field. Um, Chuck and I interacted on a, on a personal level. You know, we, didn't, we never went to dinner. I never went to his house. But there was a personal side of Chuck and, and, a, con and a concern for the players around him uh, that I, that I felt and I picked up on. And, and it was different than what the world thought of him. 
You know, I, I thought he cared about his players. I think I think at the time it was as a as a head coach, it was kind of the norm was that you you're supposed to be this this stoic kind of individual that you know I don't you know it's a football team and I don't care about a whole, whole lot of anything else. But you know, in my in my heart, I don't believe Chuck was that way. I think he struggled with that, um, uh, and I, I believe maybe he kept some of us around longer than he should have kept some of us around. And, and that was the heart of, of Chuck No, But, you know, when we started our business, I wanted that environment. I wanted to have that environment. I wanted people in, in, as a part of our organization to know that I valued them, not for just the, whatever expertise they brought to the business, but as people. I, I wanted them to know that the important part of, of, of their lives was, was not what was happening at work, but what was happening at home and that we were going to do things to support that uh, and, and, and that, that I valued that and I, th and I thought that was a, certainly a worthy thing for them to do and that if they needed to be home because of an issue going there regardless of what was going on in the business, you need to go home. And, and I, I felt that way based on what I felt about Chuck and what I felt about Dan and the, and, and, and the Rooney family. And so I brought, I brought, I wanted to have that environment. So we, we, we worked real hard to, to establish that. Yeah, we're we going to have work to do and we're going to do our work and it's going to be really good work and people are going to say, yeah, they do a great job or whatever they're doing. Um, but that people were going to enjoy coming to work. They were going to be in an environment where they thought they were respected for what they, what they do. They were going to be surrounded by people that they respected. I thought that was the environment that we had in Pittsburgh. And then if I could establish that as a business, then we were going to be successful. And I think it proved, proved that it, it was a good way to handle things. You know, we had people who had opportunities to change jobs. And in some cases, to change jobs and make more money, but who constantly made a decision that they didn't want the environment. They didn't want to leave what we had on, 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 the, on the chance that it could be maybe the same, but maybe, but chances are not the same wherever they were going to go to. And we built a company around that, a very successful company around that. John, it was wonderful catching up with you. We could uh, spend a whole lot more time, other topics to talk about, but it was uh, wonderful to spend time with you. And it's always great to see you.